Welcome back to the lab, folks. Actually, this is a mini lab. And what we're going to look at today is uh, salvaging, salvaging parts from old things. Now, this came out of a Smith Corona typewriter, uh, circa 1990, judging by the dates on these chips here. And it's one of those one of those typewriters where you can actually edit the document and revise it, almost like having a, a word processor. Uh, this has been a long dead device. They finally uh, were, were going to throw it out, and uh, they, apparently the, some of the mechanical components had failed, and it wasn't uh, worth fixing. But uh, before they threw it out, uh, they thought of me, and they pulled some of the components out of it. And what they pulled out of it was the the motherboard or the the circuit board. And this keyboard here, which is a really nice little keyboard, and I want to use this on a project. It's very strange. Uh, it's a very strange device. You see, it's got these leaf springs, and underneath this bar here, it's just like a, one of those rubber keyboards where you've got the like this is the printed circuit board. So you'll have a pattern on the printed circuit board, and you got this little rubber molding all the way down here with all the, the key switches on it and the little contacts, little conductive contacts underneath, just kind of like you'd see in a multimeter or something like that. But then they attach all the keys with these, uh, these strange leaf springs that reach over and <laughs> operate the switches. And normally those kinds of switches, if that's what you like to call them, feel like crap. Uh, but, but by doing this, Smith Corona came up with a way to make them feel pretty good. Like these feel actually quite excellent. So the, the feel is, is, is really nice, like it, you get a, a, a full travel on it and it's a hard stop at the bottom. So, so it's the kind of thing that a, a typist would like. And yeah, they did a fine job of uh, making a $200 keyboard uh, into a $20 keyboard. I, I'm only guessing at the prices, but I imagine that's the sort of ratio that you'd get between having something that had you know, real key switches in it, like cherry switches or something like that, and this, which is just one of those silicone rubber mats with a bunch of little conductive dots on it and uh, not even a PC board just uh, the whole circuit is printed out on this. So I want to use that keyboard so one of the things I really want to get out of here is the uh, socket here for the keyboard. Now like just going through this uh, device here just going through the you can see all the chips on here there's a lot a lot of handy chips so if you look at here, this is a 74 LS373 8-bit latch. These two here are, these are um, 8052 microcontrollers, but they're not, unfortunately, they're not the ones that uh, you can reprogram. They're mask programmed, so they don't have the EROM in them. Yeah, so they're useless to me. I wish they did, you know, spend the extra few pennies and put the EROM versions in, because then I could just erase them and use them for something. And here's a ROM chip. Again, it's a mass programmed ROM. I can't use that at all. But here's a RAM chip. That is uh, a that's a 2064, eight kilobyte static RAM, and 150 nanoseconds. Not blazingly fast, but it'd be good for some things if necessary. This here, this is a 74. HC-132, which is a quad NAND gate with Schmidt trigger inputs. That's a handy device. This is just a 74 LS-08, so it's a quad AND gate. And let's see what else we have here. We've got a bunch of these capacitors. These are all Rubicon capacitors. So although this is an older board, those capacitors are probably going to be just fine. We've got a nice big choke here. And uh, let's see what these chips here are. This is a 7406. So that's a, a hex inverter, but it's got open collectors and it can handle voltages up to 30 volts. We've got a whole bunch of two and three 904s here. Excuse the shuffling in the background. That's my puppy trying to get up on the chair in here. And we've got a, you know, a huge selection of diodes and rectifiers. We've got, uh, here's a type Y capacitor here, but some of the resistors on here are, are quite high tolerance. And we've got a couple of transistors here. This is a plastic 2M3055. We've got a regulator back here. And these two chips here, these are 34063s. These are like old school buck boost converters. They can also do, you can also invert the voltage. You put 10 volts in, you get minus 10 volts out. So these are real handy for putting on your own circuit boards. And over here we have a, a reset chip. It's an MC340 
lots of good stuff for me to take off here and put in my parts bin. Now these uh, 3904s, little MPN transistors, they um, they got the leads cut short, but still, they, you know, they, I took one out. They're still plenty long enough for you to play around with. And rather than using your pristine ones for experiments and stuff, you can just pop these in, just in case you get something wrong and it goes up in smoke, uh, you haven't really spent any money. It looks like this controller here is used for I.O. because this is all the I.O. stuff over here. Oh, these things here, yeah, these things, these are L6220s. They're quad Darlington switches. So they're more than just Darlington pair and then they've got um, an, an AND gate on the input and then they have an enable line. So this whole chip can be enabled or disabled. So these are quite handy too and they can drive quite a bit of current. So I think these, this is the IO section. So this processor here handled the grunt and this was the brains of the operation because it looks like it's interfaced up here through this latch to expand the address bus to these uh, memory chips up here. So this did all the thinking and they probably stored your page or two of text inside uh, this RAM here. Oh, there was also one of these uh, displays here. I, you know, I looked up the number on it here and I couldn't find anything, but I am almost 100% sure this is just one of those HD44 780 based displays. The next part of this is this. So I've got this, this Heiko gun here and um, this one here, I looked at the price of them, and when I was looking at them, Heiko wanted uh, 312 US dollars for it. And I thought, oh, that's a very painful price. But I did find out by sneaking around on the internet that you can get the Japanese model direct from Japan. Now, it still may not be for everybody because you lose your warranty. You don't get any warranty on this over here. And uh, you can get it for about, I got this one for about $175 US shipped to me. So a considerable savings over $312. It works out to be like 137 bucks or something like that. Check my math, I might be wrong. Now I do have an, an IU desoldering station, but it's, it's horrible to use. Like, first of all, it develops some leaks, so the vacuum is not quite high. And I keep patching those leaks up and it keeps developing more of them. And also the way it works, it's got one of those, those big steel springs in it as a filter, and it's just horrible to clean. And it, you need to clean it all the time. You unsolder eight or nine pins, you gotta take the thing apart, let it cool down, and clean it out and go again. Now when it's working, it works fine, but it's rarely working. Now another thing you have to do with these here is uh, they come, like in Japan it's 100 volts. Uh, here in North America, they call it 120, but where I am, I'm in a rural area, it can go anywhere from 110 to 120. So what you have to do, you have to change a resistor inside this thing. So this is the resistor that they have in there for the 100 volts. So it's, it's 10 ohms. And if you do the calculations on it, it's dropping the voltage to the motor to 98.5 volts. So it drops a, a volt and a half. And that, of course, gives you the current through it. And if you do the same calculation for the one here, what HACO do is, is they, they put in uh, two, I think it's 300 ohm resistors to get it to work in North America, but that's assuming 120 volts. So I did the calculation for me and to give me a good range without really stressing the motor a lot, I came up with uh, 220 ohms. So in parallel these to give 110. Now there is space on here to parallel them because you need the wattage. So I think if you do the calculations and you're trying to drop, it's sufficiently from 115 volts down, you need like close to three watts so I got two two watt resistors, give me four watts, there's lots of headroom there. And I put these two in and now it works at a more reasonable speed before it was revving its head off. If you want to save 137 US dollars, uh, you first of all, you forego your warranty. And second of all, you have to do that little modification. I, I, you don't have to. I've heard of lots of people who've been running these things for years on North American current and haven't had any problem at all with them but I thought to be on the safe side. And I didn't show you that process because it's all over YouTube. There's, there has to be 20 videos up of people showing you how to do this and there's other articles available too. So i bore you with that. So what I'm gonna bore you with is uh, seeing how it works to remove these components that I wanna get off. Now, the, the one I'm gonna get off here is this one here. I want that socket because I wanna play around with that keyboard, but I'll eventually get all these off of here and use them for something. Let's see how this does. 
in uh, getting this socket off. The idea with these, and I found out this one, my IU one, is that uh, don't put too much pressure on those pads. Just very gingerly put it down there, get the solder melting, and then rotate it around just a little bit and operate it for a second or two. What you don't want to do is put too much pressure on the pads, because especially this era, the pads seem to be not very well stuck down to the boards. Now this should just uh, gingerly pull out, just like that. A lot of times what they'll do, they'll just fall out. But this has got enough pins on there, I guess, that, so that, that got that out cleanly. And you could tell that even if I was repairing this board, we've done no damage at all to all these pads. That not too hard to do because it's just a single-sided board. But we have here another board that I want to almost completely salvage this board because I've got a serial interface there, a high-speed RAM here, 65 CO2 microprocessor here, which are uh, kind of expensive and sometimes difficult to get. And over here is a programmable logic chip. And so I want, this one's on a socket, I can just pop that out, but it's got a nice machined socket underneath it and I want to get that, uh, but I especially want this socket here. Now these sockets are, they got a, a, a thing on them that says RN. If anybody knows where to get these sockets, please let me know. These sockets are a godsend. So they're almost as good as a zero insertion force socket. Now they don't have zero insertion force, but they have very nice insertion force, but still hold onto the chip well. They have these little things underneath here for them to easily put in something to remove the chip. And if you look at the way they're built, they've got the, the outside contacts are at an angle going in like this. So they guide, if even if the legs aren't exactly vertical, they guide the chip in. They're really nice if, because this is where I put the ROM and it's really nice to be able to pull it out, reprogram it, and put it back in again. These sockets are absolutely wonderful. So I'm gonna try and get this one out. This being a double-sided board is going to be more of a challenge. But uh, let's, let's start out here, see where we can get with it. One, uh, one pin there got a little bit stuck, this second pin coming down here, but we got it off. The whole screw got a little bit of solder in it, but we could easily get that off. No damage done to any of the pads. It did a very good job there, and I got my, my wonderful, marvelous, priceless socket here. Now, I do have coming to me from AliExpress a kind of like a Chinese version of this. And I will do a review on that one because it's much more cost effective even than buying it from Japan and doing the modifications that I already mentioned. Yeah, it's only about $123 US and it comes equipped for use in North America. Uh, for a few dollars more, you can get a kit with that uh, includes three extra tips and some additional accessories. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you got something out of it and I uh, hope to see you in the next one. Bye now.